Okay, welcome to another episode of Simple English Listening. Today we have a special treat for you. We're introducing my friend Frank. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, we work together, and Frank has a an interesting life story. So he has lived in、uh, so many countries, right? Yes. Yeah, like about how many would you say? I I would have to think about it, but I, yeah, I'd say around nine, about close to nine countries, almost ten. Wow.、Um, and then yeah, you speak like like a million different languages. Well,、yeah. not a million, but a、uh, hundred. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so. I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to listen to what、well, somebody who's gone through the language learning process and had to adapt to many different cultures around the world.、Uh, don't forget to check out the the Facebook Simple English Listening and the YouTube and the podcast Simple English Listening on Spotify, iTunes, blah blah blah, and the podcast app Castbox. So with Castbox, you can slow down. The speed of what we're saying, so you can better understand it. Okay, so don't forget Castbox, where you can change the speed of the podcast. Castbox, C A S T B O X. Okay, so first off, how many schools do you think you've gone to? Oh wow! So、um, from. K through twelve, I probably went to about maybe six, maybe six different schools,、uh, six or seven schools from kindergarten until twelfth grade, and then、yeah. uh, I ended up. I went to three different high schools, yeah, and I went to three different universities too, actually. But finally, got my degree from、uh, from one in the U.S. So many times he was the new kid at the front of the class. Uh, you know, everyone introducing you. Hey, say hello to your new, you know, student Frank, and you're there, like a little boy at the front, waving at everyone. Yes, <laughs> yes, being perpetually the new kid everywhere you go. Yeah,、um, it's it's interesting. It's sort of a double edged sword because.、Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have his pet dog here, Chumchi. Sorry about that. Be quiet.、Um, <laughs> So yeah, you're kind of perpetually the new kid, and, and it, it, <laughs> stop. <All right. laughs> He's like, pay attention to me.、Um, so yeah, you you it can work for you and it can work against you.、Um, you know, you, it, it sort of gives you a chance to reinvent yourself, which、mm. especially when you're younger, you know,、yeah. teenagers love to do that. Sort of, all right, well, I'm gonna be the The art, the artsy kid this time around, or I'm gonna be、mm. the, I'm gonna be really into sports in, in this.、School. I see. Yeah, you、I'm、can gonna, redesign. Yeah, you sort of redesign yourself. yourself yeah, <laughs> and、uh, you learn to be very good at first impressions. You also learn、mm. to to be whether for、uh, whether for for good or bad. It's、um, you become a very quick judge of character. Now you're、mm. not always right. You, you know you can still misjudge people, but you do、yeah. learn to be more judgmental of people faster. I would say than than normal. <laughs>、uh, so he's picked up his dog and holding him now. So I think now the dog's got more attention on him. Maybe he'll start barking. <laughs> Oh yeah, so when you'd start at schools, would they like pair you up with somebody to be like, you know, your buddy? Usually, yeah, <laughs> that, that was actually a quite common、uh, strategy.、Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you'd be the new kid, and usually it was、uh, it was either one of two types of student. It was either the lonely nerd who had no friends, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or it was like the overly popular and vapid, like. Girl, you know, in the class that was, yeah, yeah it didn't have much sense about anything, but was was kind, you know, and, yeah. And they have to show you around, and you have you sit with them at lunch and all that. Yeah,、right? yeah, exactly. So, so you're not the like the, the kid with no friends on the、yeah. table by himself <laughs> eating lunch. Yeah, I actually learned it to enjoy. <laughs> I prefer eating alone. It's、uh, you don't have to. You don't have to carry on、uh, pointless conversation with、uh, people you don't like. <laughs> 
Yeah, fair enough. So why? Why did you go to so many different schools and so many different countries? So my father uh, was a career naval officer. Mm. So he was in the U.S. Navy for almost 30 years. Mm. And the career path that he had selected, basically, he had to move constantly. He was always getting stationed to a new base, mm. a new... Uh, you know, a new place. And um, so every two, on average, about every two years, we'd move. Yeah. Sometimes it'd be three years, sometimes it'd be one year, you know, it would change. But on average, about two years in one place, and then we'd move on to the next one. Wow. And we had no idea where we were going until maybe three or four weeks before. Well, and even your father? Yeah, didn't even know. my father didn't know. We would be just waiting, you know, and we'd be sitting around. Sometimes it was great because he'd come in and say, Hey guys, like we're moving to Italy next month. It was like, yeah. And then other times it'd be like, Hey guys, we're moving to Indiana. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Wow. So it's quite a thrill even for him, you know, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. where will we go next? So it must've been very exciting to hear you were going to like, like Italy is one place you lived, Portugal, right? Uh, well, uh, Spain, Spain. Yeah. Yeah. Spain. And, um, Hawaii, that was uh, quite a thrill. Uh, Also, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, yeah, yeah. In the middle of nowhere, in the middle of America. (laughs) (laughs) You know, they all have good things and bad things, you know, and I think that's that's something you learn to appreciate um, Mm -hmm. when you get older. Moving around so much, you're kind of always looking for the the most ideal place, right? Where where do you want to live? It needs to have, it needs to have this, it needs to have that. Um... And you realize as you get older that there really is no, there is no perfect place, but a good way, a good way to, uh, to sort of manage your expectations mm. is to make a list, like a top 10. What are the top 10 things you want out of somewhere you live? Um, you know, does it have mountains or beaches or shopping or parks or public transportation or, you know, things that you find important to, but, but to, when you, for your quality of life. But when you put somewhere, you've got no choice. So you just have to make the most. So you have to make the most of it, exactly. Yeah. And you know what? If you end up in a place that has 8 out of 10... <laughs> motherfucker. If, <laughs> if, you have, if you end up in a place uh, that has 8 out of 10, you know, of, of things you need, that's those are really good. That's really good. Like, yeah. um you know, it sort of it sort of teaches you to manage your expectations a bit, and also to to be more <laughs> realist. Mm. And how is it to be the son of a military man? You know, is he like ah oh, turn John every morning, <laughs> like shine your shoes? You yeah, know? yeah. We had to do PT every morning. And, no, no. <laughs> um, actually, my dad was very, very uh, laid back because he mm. he wasn't a soldier. He was a uh, and he was a sailor. So the Navy, the Navy's a little bit more laid back than like the Army or the Marines. But also he was a, uh, he was an engineer. Mm. So he's, he's a very smart, very educated guy. Very, very calm. Yeah. Um, very analytical. So, you know, he, he understood. Yeah. So, and moving around that often was his job something along the lines of you'd have to teach people to have to do a certain skill and then move on to the next yeah. base or something like that maybe well and i have to say he he was probably the best father for the situation uh my my sibling and i were in because mm-hmm. uh he grew up the same way my grandfather was in the army and okay. he was a career army guy yeah. and so my dad did the same thing my dad moved more than i did he he went to 12 different schools from oh. k through 12 so literally he never finished the same school yeah. that he started at in that fall it was always he was just constantly moving so he, he understood very well what it was like to grow up that way. So he was, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was a great father. Wow. So if you could quickly summarize your life story and where you moved to. All right. All right. I'll try to, all right. Lightning round. So you were born. Uh, I was born in, uh, <laughs> in a suburb of uh, Seattle. And then we moved to Virginia, just uh, actually Virginia Beach. And then mm. we moved to uh, close to, to Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia. Mm. And then uh, ended up in Oklahoma. And then we went to Italy. Mm. And, and how then, old were you about This then? was all before five. All before five. <laughs> wow. And then uh, when I was in kindergarten, first grade, uh, 
that was stationed in Sardinia, Italy. And then uh, we went to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then we went to New Hampshire, right on the border of Maine and New Hampshire. Um, yeah. So Stephen King land. Which is the northeast the of the northeast. USA. Yeah. Very, very beautiful. And then we moved back to Italy, but this time uh, Naples, Italy. Ooh, and Napoli. Napoli. <laughs> and that was uh, from 12 until about 15. Yeah. And then we moved to Indiana, to rural... Trump land. Trump land, yeah. yes. We, we went from the bosom of Mediterranean culture <laughs> to, uh, you know, literally the first thing anyone ever said to me in that town was, uh, hey there, where are you from? And I said, uh, well, I'm, I'm American, but I, uh, I just moved here from Italy. He was like, Italy? You Italian or something? <laughs> no? He goes, well... Well, we don't like fags or foreigners around here. Yeah, that's the first thing they <laughs> the said to you. first thing he said to me. Wow. That was a, quite an interesting uh, conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you must have been thinking, you know, what, what has my dad done to me, <laughs> moving me here? <laughs> well, and that was it, man. I, I had such a strong distaste for living there and... and uh, <laughs> All the all the negative stereotypes you can think of mm. as far as like you know deep red Republican <laughs> America, yeah. well, it was true you know and and half the girls were pregnant before sixteen and <laughs> all the guys were you know they weren't going to college you know they they <laughs> might yeah, yeah. they might get a job at a factory or go in the military otherwise yeah. they're going to start you know doing meth and like end up in prison yeah I mean it was it was bleak very bleak uh, sad sad place to live. And I was there, and there was this little foreign kid in my class. He's from Armenia, I think, or Georgia. Georgia, Armenia. Yeah. I should probably get that right. Hope any of your listeners aren't upset. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, he, he was a cool little kid. He was very, very soft-spoken. He could play the piano like insane. He was like a classical pianist. It was unbelievable mm. how, how good he was at the piano. But I asked him, I said, hey, man, like, what, like, what are you doing here of all places? Mm. And he was like, oh, I'm doing an exchange program. And I was mm. like, oh, like, how do you do that? Yeah, and he said, "Oh well, I can put you in touch with uh, the chairman of uh, the local uh, club here, and uh, mm -hmm. there you go." And then the rest was history. I, I signed up, and mm -hmm. I was like, "Get me out of here as quickly as possible." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so they asked me where I wanted to go, and uh, I had been studying French for years in school, yeah. and um, but I didn't wasn't too keen on France. Mm. Well, we can get into that later, but. Uh, <laughs> Basically, it was either going to be Switzerland, Belgium, or Quebec. Okay. And I basically narrowed in on Belgium because uh, I had actually traveled there before. Mm -hmm. And I remembered how much I liked it. How it's... Belgium's such an interesting mix of Latin culture and Germanic culture. And it's, it's, it's the farthest north Latin culture in Europe. Okay. Right? So when you get up to like Brussels, like it's basically... The surrounding areas are all Germanic. So... Mm. The beer and the the religion and the uh, well the language and it's just sort of the culture in general is very very Germanic and yet you still have this little French bulge pushing into okay to, into Germanic Europe um, so yeah it was a Ooh. fantastic place so I went there for one year on a exchange program and that was before university yes that right. was my last year of high school so okay. I left at seventeen and stayed for one year and came back uh, to start uni. And then did uni. Uh, I originally went to, I started at a community college because uh, I had no clue what I wanted to study or what I wanted to do with my life. Went to a community college for about six months. Um, really disliked it. It just wasn't a, it, it's not like that sh television show community. I wish it was. That would have been awesome. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a much more depressing. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was all, it was filled with just like, you know, non-traditional students so everyone was you know a lot of moms and housewives yeah. and you know guys who just got out of prison and like yeah just was, everyday just, people yeah it, it was yeah. so like the you know the typical 18 to 22 year old college experience mm. was not was not there so i transferred and uh went to school in oklahoma yeah in, oklahoma in the middle of middle of america yeah this is a very famous musical called oklahoma yeah. That's my first experience of Oklahoma. Yeah. I just, I just remember being there when I was like ten, watching a musical, and it was all you know, like tradition and cowboys and yeah. you know, 
yeah, this they, kind of thing, like small, dusty towns in the middle of nowhere. Is it like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the town I went to, to school in, um, the nearest city is about maybe a one hour drive. And, oh, wow. Um, so this, this town is a, you get a lot of these types of towns in America where mm. college towns mm. where you have, you know, maybe a hundred thousand people live in these towns, but over half the population is under the age of 25. Mm. So, you know, very few people live there year round. They're, yeah. you know, they're either seasonal workers or they're students. Um, so if you go there in the summertime, the town's completely empty. The, the town goes from a hundred thousand to like 30,000. Uh, you know, over the course of a, just a, a week and then mm. it's dead all summer. Yeah. And then the week before school starts again, everyone comes back and the town explodes again. So it was actually a fun sort of experience to live in a town like that. Cause I, I, I don't think you can find that in many places in the world. Mm. Mm. I mean, in the UK, there are some towns like that, you yeah. know, just student, student heavy towns. So as a man who's never settled anywhere, settled means to to live for a long time for the rest of your life. As a man who's never settled anywhere, will you ever settle anywhere, do you think? And if so, where would it be? That's a good question. Or do you think you'll always live a life on the road, you know, well, like a gypsy? Yeah. Like a Viking? I mean, that... I, yeah, I can't see myself really settling down for anywhere longer than a few years. I mean, actually now, here is the longest I've lived anywhere, mm. going on four, four and a half years. Yeah, and we're in Vietnam right yeah. now. But uh, again, you know, I, I don't plan on staying here forever. You know, I'm going to, I want to move on to the next place. Mm. Um, however, I do, I would like to have maybe a like a part-time home or like maybe buy like a little farm somewhere and you know, as like a, a go-to place yeah, just a regular just, place to go on holiday you know go there once a year just you know head yeah. back to the farm for the summer and work on stuff and, and just oh. slowly man maintain a, a small little farm spend it all summer just making a pointless wall in the back garden yeah exactly in the sun you <laughs> yeah. know with a beer because you've not, got nothing else to do exactly yeah. like a little chicken coop <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, you know, a few of them pot belly pigs. Yeah, know? exactly. Maybe a donkey to you know, help you do your work. Yeah, and <laughs> and depending on where where this farm is, I mean, ideally, it'd be like in a Mediterranean climate. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. The pocket, you could be the in, back in book. Indiana. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I would say I don't think I'll be able to afford to live in Europe, but uh, who knows? We'll see. But maybe South America or or somewhere in North America. Mm. And, um, yeah. And then, you know, after who knows, 10, 20 years when I start to get old and decrepit mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, m move permanently to this little farm that I've had for years, that, that would mm. be a, a nice, uh, sort of, um, where I'm looking for lifestyle. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I, I will get to there eventually. <laughs> so, and you've also lived in Brazil. Right? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. spent about six months in Brazil, Spain, Italy, uh, all around America, uh, yeah. and Belgium, Belgium, and Italy, Vietnam, Vietnam, and South Korea, South Korea, we and China, both, and China. Yeah, 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 these are all the countries Dave's lived. South Korea, China, Vietnam are all as a EFL English teacher. Well, Brazil and Chile as well, and Brazil and Chile. Yeah. Okay, and Chile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I spent about four months in forgot. Santiago, and. Um, mm -hmm. I loved it. it. It was just uh, financially, I, I, I couldn't stay there. It's, it's yeah. a quite expensive place and you don't make much money as a teacher there. So, And you also lived in Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I went to LA and caught the acting bug and uh, although wasn't really much acting, but... Um... <laughs> yeah. But you went to some auditions. Huh? I did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I... Dave, Dave tried to... I guess, make it as a, an actor or a screenwriter or a script writer yeah. or something like that in the, in LA, yeah. Hollywood. That was the, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, I was, I was in my twenties, I was in my mid twenties and, mm. uh, I had a, I had a good job, a very boring job, but yeah. it was a good job. It was a sustainable job. Mm. I could have probably stayed there at that company for 20 years, you know? However, I realized that I was going to spend 20 years of my life 
in this big factory, yeah. stuck behind a computer, talking to strangers on the telephone eight hours a day, all yeah. day, for, 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 yeah, for a majority of my life. And I just thought to myself, good God, like, what a horrible life. Well, yeah, <laughs> when I was 19, because I'm a musician, I love rock and roll music, I mean, a, a band. When I was 19, I moved to London to try and become a professional musician. And in the end, it was just 12 hours a day, just working, like picking up phones, uh, people complaining why their free housing benefit hasn't gone through, people threatening me on the phones, like, oh, hey, mate, why isn't my housing benefit? Just like this office, this soulless, spiritless office, just picking up phones for like, yeah, eight hours a day. It was like two hours to get to work, two hours back. By the time the weekend came, I was too tired to make any music, you know? Yeah. But anything creative, I think now with the internet, with uh, YouTube, Spotify, all these great apps, you can be a creative person, an artist, musician. You can be based in many countries around the yeah. world. And if you're good enough, you'll be discovered on the internet more than 15 years ago when you were in Hollywood, I was in London. You yeah. Know. I uh, mean, uh, I think about that too. The, the idea of the YouTube celebrity did not exist yet. YouTube was around, yeah. but it was still this brand new sort of, uh, no one really thought of it as a, as a content site. Everyone just thought of it as, Oh, it's a site you can upload videos. Yeah. Whereas, you know, subscribing and channels and things like that hadn't really, become a thing yet yeah this was like what was that maybe 10 years ago yeah. 2011 2012 something like that it was still yeah. in its in its infancy and um so yeah when i went to to la streaming hadn't taken over yet netflix hadn't taken over i mean it, mm. it was starting but it was still very much like the old vanguard of, of yeah. hollywood and i think you see it in music like i feel if you've created a music track like a song which is truly good, people will listen to it by word of mouth. People will start sharing it with each other, you know, sharing it to friends, and it will get out there. If it's truly good music, like you just put it on the internet and it will spread, you know. It's awesome. But yeah, this is the new age. Yeah, we're talking about 15 years ago when things were different. So let's talk about language. And how many languages do you speak comfortably? That's a good question. And uncomfortably. All know? right. Well, comfortably, as far as I have either studied or worked speaking the language and in the office and you yeah. know, being, having it be a part of my every day, mm -hmm. um, both French and Spanish. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, my French and Spanish are professionally good enough to to use in a workplace or, or to study at university. Um, my Italian and my Portuguese are probably the next best. Um, however, that a lot of that is sort of cheating because... <laughs> but he, he's a great actor, Dave. So he, <laughs> he puts on the accent of Italian and Portuguese and you, and you think he's absolutely fluent <laughs> just because he can sound like perfectly like a real guy from Napoli or it Italy or whatever. Yeah. And, um, as far as like, mm, so, so I can, I can stumble a around and ask directions and order food mm. in probably a few other languages like German and Dutch, uh, yeah. probably Korean as well. I'd throw in there, uh, Vietnamese, the same, mm -hmm. you know, sort of a advanced beginner, if you will, I mean, not, not good enough to be considered intermediate, but, but better than a beginner. Mm. And the languages you're best at they are all of the romance languages. The romance languages is what we call the language family of languages that mostly come from Latin, mm -hmm. and Greek, like Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese. Yes, romance as in uh, taking after Rome, not not romance as in like romantic. Okay. So, yeah, romance uh, comes from it comes from Rome, from Latin. I've learned something new. Yeah. I just thought it was because it's the most romantic sounding language. <laughs> Yeah. Nice. But yeah, well, the fun thing about romance languages is if you learn one, 
the amount of effort it takes to learn the other is it's incredible how how little effort it takes um, yeah. so if you're a spanish speaker or an italian speaker or a french speaker or even a romanian speaker uh portuguese what have you to learn one of the other romance languages or even a dialect like if you want to learn uh catalan mm-hmm. although a lot of people insist catalan is a is a separate language entirely but i mean for example if you look at the word exit in mm. French. So the word exit in French is uh, sortie, right? S O R T I E, mm-hmm. sortie. Mm-hmm. The the Spanish word for exit is salida, la salida, the the exit. Mm-hmm. So the Catalan word, if you look at Catalonia, it's in between France and Spain. Mm-hmm. What's the Catalan word for exit? Yeah. Sortida. So okay. salida, yeah. sortie, sortida. Yeah. And so you get a lot of these just just minute minuscule changes in the language. Mm. Enough so that if you aren't around it, it is, you know, obviously it's a different language, but it's so they're so similar in so many ways that you can you can learn uh, a, another romance language within probably a few months, I would say. Yeah, so what was the first romance language that you learned? Um, Italian, actually, from, okay. from living in Italy as a as a small boy and again as a mm. teenager. That sort of planted the seed. So then you found it, did you find it quite easy to, do you remember having to switch from one romance language to another? Or from French to Spanish or Spanish to French? Because those are yes. your strongest languages. Yes. So the, the process of like transferring from one romance language to another, was it quite quick and, and easy or was it, yes, or how did you but, do it? I mean, it would depend because I think French and Spanish, there's, mm. there's enough of a difference in culture and, yeah. and language where it, it was pretty seamless. It was fairly easy to, to change my mind and, and mm. to think in a different language. Um, but the one that got me was Portuguese and Spanish. Okay. When I went down to South America, uh, mm. my Spanish was very, very strong. And um, I ended up in Brazil and uh, particularly Brazilian Portuguese. You, I would say about half, 50% of the language is practically identical to Spanish. It really is. And, but the other 50% is completely mm. different. Mm. And especially in Portuguese uh, or Brazilian Portuguese, because they use a lot of indigenous words and a lot of borrowed words mm-hmm. because they had... They have a massive uh, indigenous. Indigenous meaning the the people ethnically native to a land. Yes, yeah, so yeah. like the Native American uh, uh, people, the tribes and, and stuff. So, for example, the uh, the Brazilian Portuguese word for pineapple is one of my favorite words to say. It's abacaxi. Wow, abacaxi derives from a native indigenous Brazilian uh, tribal word for uh, mm-hmm. for that. So they, they, you get a lot of these funny, interesting. Uh, but I, I would That's notice an amazing word. Yeah, it's very fun to say. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? it is. Say abacaxi. It one more time for the listeners. Abacaxi. Abacaxi. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And um, but I would I noticed a lot in 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 Brazil. I I use Spanish a lot as a crutch because I would basically speak Spanish with a Brazilian accent mm. and everyone would, would understand. They call it a uh, Portunol. Yeah. So um, basically you speak a hybrid of Portuguese and Spanish and, uh, okay. and they'll understand you, but yeah, Portunol. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, do you remember any language learning ideas or techniques or were you too young to consciously you know, you know well i think because you, you probably learn language quite naturally because of your environment exactly right? yeah. i mean that that's the the one the one thing i noticed is the languages i am proficient at are the languages where i lived in those countries and mm. i was basically surrounded by non-english speakers so it it learning the language is really broke came down to to survival and you know if i want to have a life here i need to learn the language and you know i remember in in uh in belgium i had studied french for years in school but i didn't remember remember much mm-hmm. so the first like three four months i was in belgium every day when i'd come home i would i would study you know common verbs common nouns you know the most the most common uh, um, 
expressions and things like that to sort of um, yeah. it's it's actually a similar it's what the defense language uh, institute does in the united states mm -hmm. uh, for military and for embassy workers mm -hmm. they send you to a school and basically they teach you you know the hundred most common words like that's the first thing you learn and then they teach you the next the next round is you know common expressions and and then uh, sentence structure and and so they basically work almost in a similar way a child would, you know, if mm. you have a small child, they're mm. going to, whether they're two or three years old, they're going to know water, milk, you know, poo poo or pee pee or whatever, you know, and, and, <laughs> and they, they learn those, uh, those, cause those are the basic common words that they need for their survival. Yeah. For those listening to the podcast, you might know by now, I'm a big fan believer that you should first learn the 1000 then 2,000, then 3,000 most frequently used words. Because for most languages, you should understand to some level, I think it's 82, 82, 82% 82 of a language, spoken language is within the 1,000 most frequently used words. And then 90% is within the 2,000 most frequently used words. What you're saying makes lots of sense to me, yeah. using that as a foundation, yeah. Yes. And, you know, it really would work. It, it was the same in, in with Spanish. You know, after after I learned French, I started university, started studying Spanish. And I noticed how I didn't even have to study for the Spanish because mm -hmm. it was the grammar and the words like I explained earlier with Catalan and Spanish and, and French that there's there's they're all from the same language family. Yeah. And so it was so easy to remember the vocabulary. And the conjugation of the verbs was almost identical, um, especially written, you know, spoken is mm -hmm. a little different, but, but the way it's written, I mean, it's almost identical. The rules are basically the same. And so learning Spanish was, it was a breeze in school. And then I went to Spain thinking, okay, I got this in the bag. Like my Spanish is really good. But then I was hit with a different problem I, I wasn't ready for. And that's sort of the delivery and the speed at which Spanish people speak, um, especially people from Madrid. They they speak incredibly fast. They speak yeah. so quickly, and they do speak with proper grammar because Madrid is sort of the gold standard of Spanish in in the Spanish speaking mm -hmm. world. And um, but good, yeah, good night, nurse. They would speak so fast, and you would just have to sit there and tune your ear to try to get everything they were saying, yeah. and then processing what they're saying in your mind as they're continuing it, it was yeah that was the listening became a really big challenge as far as uh but again after a few months it was fine you know your mm -hmm. your ear sort of adjusts to the to the speed and well that's one thing like i remember when i first heard spanish when i was much younger like i could not believe how fast like it sounded you know it's like <laughs> well it's also one of those languages that lends itself to speaking quickly because a lot of it is soft consonant sounds mixed with a lot of vowels, mostly A and O. And so it lends itself to be spoken quickly because you can just kind of go, -da 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 -da. you, you don't yeah, have to. That's how it sounds. Yeah, sometimes. you don't have to, to. It's not as harsh on your throat. Or, or your mouth is, say, German or French, yeah. which is really like, you know, like it yeah. really hits you. Yeah. It's spoken in a different part of the, the, the mouth. Mm. And um, yeah, it comes more from the front of your mouth rather than the back of your throat. Yeah, I remember because I lived in France, in Toulouse, when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And I started studying Spanish at school when I was about 14. And it was just so easy yeah. you know, compared to you know, how I was at other subjects. As far as language goes, you know, may maybe I was just really lucky growing up, you know, moving around and living in, in uh, romance speaking countries, romance language mm -hmm. countries. And so I just have a, a, key, uh, a more uh, fine tuned ear to those languages. But uh, it wasn't until my late twenties that I was introduced to tonal languages. So like Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Thai, mm -hmm. Cambodian. And it was my first experience with tonal languages living in, mm. in mainland China. And I, I tried to take a few classes 
And my goodness, it was, it's an incredibly unforgiving language. Mm. Uh, any tonal language is incredibly unforgiving with mistakes because the moment you make a mistake, it means it a means different a word, a completely different word. And, and they think, look at you like a madman when you're trying to order like the most simple thing yeah. and you're messing it up and you don't realize instead of saying like, Oh, and, you, and you're trying to order like some, some chicken, chicken and, yeah. and you're and, calling it like a ghost mum yeah. or something. <laughs> Ghost exactly. mum, ghost mum. That's exactly it. Yeah. I, I think I saw a meme like the other day and it was saying like M-A in Vietnamese is like nine different things. Yeah. Depending on the tone. Like ma, ma, ma. And like yeah, said it yeah. all different ways. And the sound of it is just, if you were an early like European coming to Vietnam, you know, two, three hundred years ago, the sound of Vietnamese must have been like nothing you've ever heard before. You know, it's very unique. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing Vietnamese lessons right now because, yes. because you, his wife forces him <laughs> <laughs> so you can better speak to her family, I yeah. guess. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, and I am doing the same approach, uh, as far as learning the hundred most common words, you know, the mm -hmm. who, what, when, where, one to a hundred um, prepositions of place and time and, you know, the, all those sort of beginner level things that you learn. And um, it works. However, my listening's gotten much better. I can sort of understand basic conversation. But again, yeah. anytime I try to say something, no one understands what I'm saying. Because yeah. I still cannot get those tones. I, I couldn't hear the tones for the first maybe two or three years I lived here. Yeah. And it wasn't until after about two or three years I started to hear the tones differently. Mm -hmm. But I still can't say the tones differently. So I'm Yeah. I'm sort of like a mute, like in a, <laughs> I'm like a dumb mute <laughs> in Vietnamese. Yeah, I've studied Vietnamese here and there. And I often find that I'll say a sentence in Vietnamese. And then they'll start speaking back to me in Vietnamese. And I just have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> so difficult because it's like Vietnamese people's ears are more attuned to different tones. Yes. Whereas yeah. for us, we're not used to tones. It's not, a, and it doesn't change the meaning, you know, so yeah, much. Yeah. yeah, to be able to decipher, like differentiate the different tones in listening to a whole sentence yeah it's very difficult yeah, yeah yeah if someone if someone says something longer than you know a few words <laughs> I, I i can't i can't follow I, can't. <laughs> yeah. I get like one or two and then but i don't want to assume yeah that that's what they're saying because of the two words i understood and yeah yeah, yeah it's well we'll both be uh learning more vietnamese in the future watch this space maybe we'll be you know far improved this time in six months mm -hmm. we'll see what happens maybe we'll be able to listen successfully to you know the person on the street like shouting at you about this or that <laughs> <laughs> trying to sell you snail noodles and uh yeah here in hanoi yeah there's lots of uh, street food on the side of the road yeah okay so um anything else you can think of Mm, no. Okay, well, I want to say a massive thank you to Frank. <laughs> Thanks for having me. He's been an awesome guest, and I hope that you guys have uh, opened your ears and your hearts to uh, someone who's had a very different perspective in their life experience because they've just lived everywhere, you know, like no one place to call home, but just always a life on the road going through different cultures, different languages, uh, different countries. Okay, all the best, guys. See you next week. Bye.